All right, hello everybody. Uh, today we're gonna walk through how to do post hoc tests, which are the tests you run after you've gotten significant effects in an ANOVA. Uh, and uh, hopefully it won't be too long, because if nothing else, I need to get out of here in 45 minutes to go pick up my daughter from school. But um, also we've talked quite a bit about one way and two way ANOVAs as it is. So I don't wanna take up too much more of your time, but this is a necessary step in the process. So, because otherwise you won't really be able to understand or interpret what your ANOVA is telling you. Um, speaking of which, at the end of the last lecture, we were playing around with the two-way ANOVA for baseball stats, as you might recall, uh, as just an example of how to run a two-way ANOVA. So what I'm gonna do is load those stats back into my R console and then show you the results of the ANOVA that we ran. So we looked at the handedness of batters and pitchers uh, for um, a specific stat called batting base production average, uh, which is something of my own invention, but that's besides the point because what we found is there's basically an interaction between uh, the handednesses of the batter and the pitcher on what that average is. Those two things together have an effect on what the average is, but when they're just by themselves, they don't matter in any significant way, according to this two-way ANOVA analysis. Uh, although this one's pretty close for pitcher. At the very end of that lecture or example, I uh, wanted to run through a couple of linear regression commands and tried to do so and kind of failed to figure out what I was doing. Uh, so I wanted to sort of just patch that up before I move on to the post hoc analysis of this interaction. Um, but the first of these was looking at the batter and pitcher factors with the interaction. And I think this is the one I successfully ran. And it basically shows everything as being significant in this particular case. Um, yeah, and this is just a linear regression, so it's not quite the same thing as in ANOVA, even though they're kind of based on the same principles. Uh, and what I did at the end of the lecture was I ran this command with the AOV here. I hadn't changed this part to the LM, so it's um, a different command because it's running a different set of analysis, sort of analysis. Uh, and I also changed this part to being batter plus pitcher rather than batter asterisk pitcher, so this includes the interaction up here, and this gets rid of the interaction. Uh, and this is the linear regression level again, so it's not the same thing as the ANOVA. But the funny thing is that you go, when you get rid of that interaction here, uh, it, you go from having everything here be significant to nothing being significant, even though uh, it looks like these two here are the main effects, which are significant once you figure out what the interaction is doing. And then once you sort of just throw the interaction back in there as part of the main effects, then these go away. Uh, and the other thing I wanted to say was that you can kind of look at how much variance the models are accounting for by um, just looking at these R squared values. So with the interaction model, uh, we're accounting for about a quarter of the variance overall, about 0.25. And then for the non-interaction model, for where nothing is significant, we can't figure out what's going on at all, uh, the um, R-squared value is about 0 0.01 or 0 0.02. We're, we're counting for very little, if any, of the variance in the average with just the batter and pitcher factors by themselves. So it makes a big difference if you include that interaction in there. And I will say on top of that, uh, I'll give you some practical advice in just um, working with these stats in sort of the linguistics publication environment. So we can compare the mathematical models we have for these two different approaches where one just has the main effects and the other has the interaction term. So with the main effects, um, our value for any specific value of Y is going to be the grand mean plus the uh, factor treatment for factor alpha plus the factor treatment for factor beta specific to whatever factor levels you're playing around with there, i and j in this particular case. And then there's an error term, um, which is just specific to any individual observation. Uh, the only th way the interaction differs from that is that it includes this interaction term, or the interaction model differs because it has this interaction term, but has all the other parts of it in there as well. Um, but basically it's the same y sub i, j, k in both cases. We're getting the same sort of output data from the models. Um, and if this interaction is significant when I try to analyze it this way, 
uh, then this interaction is actually going to have an effect on these factor treatments if I leave it out in this main effects model, this main effects only model up here. Um, because that data is still in there, it's going to kind of get absorbed to some extent by the error term, but it will also have an effect on these uh, factor treatments as well. So the um, model for main effects can be surreptitiously influenced by the unrecognized interactions that you aren't including in your approach to the model or your specification of the model. So the rule of thumb that you're supposed to adhere to when you report the results of the NANOVA is that if you get a significant interaction, you're supposed to ignore any significant main effects that it might influence in your post-hoc analysis. So in this example um, that I gave you, going back to the start here, um, we just have a significant interaction and both of our main effects are not significant, so we don't have to worry about that here. But let's say this pitcher effect was um, had a slightly smaller p-value, like a p-value of 0.04 or something like that, uh, then we consider it to be significant. Uh, but what the rule of thumb is saying is that even if pitcher is significant here, kind of don't poke around with that any further because what you might be seeing as significant for the main effect here uh, might just be the result of including the batter pitcher interaction down here. Um, like for instance, the uh, this approach, we get significant effects of batter and pitcher here, but it's only because we're um, excluding, uh, it's only because we're including this interaction of term here uh, and those kind of emerge. Um, so watch out for that. If you get a significant interaction, you're supposed to go straight to that and figure out what's going on in the interaction and ignore what's going on up here, um, whether it's significant or not. However, I will say in practice, this can be easier said than done. Uh, and in my experience, what I normally do if I get both significant main effects and significant interactions is that I do take a look at what the main effects seem to be showing me to begin with uh, before I dig further into the interaction. And the reason I do that is just because it's simpler to see whatever pattern might be in the main effect. Uh, and the interaction can get complicated fairly quickly. Um, so if I get a sense of sort of like how to contextualize that interaction effect, it's a le little easier to interpret later on. Um, so in that case, I'm saying here, it's often easiest to understand the interaction as a deviation from the main effects. Uh, yeah, so <laughs> uh, like I said, I'm not an official statistician, so I can't have my like certificate, certificate of statistics being like revoked from my, you know, the wall behind my desk or something like that. Uh, by saying this, I'm just saying this as a practical matter. It's going to be probably easier for you to figure out what's going on if you do it this way rather than the official way. Um, but when you report the stats, you're probably going to want to try to do it the official way and ignore the main effects uh, and just dig into the interactions. But the overall moral of the story is that before you get into analyzing anything, before you find out what the results of your NOVA are, you should just run an analysis that looks at all the possible effects. And by that, I mean both the main effects and the interactions. Don't assume like, well, this won't matter or this won't matter, whatever. Just throw it all in there um, because you don't want to prejudge your data ahead of time. You want to find out what it's actually trying to tell you. Um, the only way in which it makes sense, it would make sense to eliminate the main effects is if you're developing a linear model to describe the data after you've run the analysis of variance. Um, so you can kind of do that with this approach um, that I was showing you before. Uh, so if the ANOVA says, oh, we only get a significant interaction here between batter and pitcher, um, and these main effects don't matter, uh, you can build a model um, with just that interaction term in it um, by, believe it or not, subtracting those main effects like this. And hopefully you can see that. And if you can't, maybe I'll just raise this up a bit so it's closer to the center of your screen. Uh, yeah, so if I do this, it's kind of funny the way this spits out, um, but it shows me all the different kind of level combinations of batters and pitchers here. Uh, and some of them have a bigger effect on the results than others. We're not going to sort of go through the um, details here because uh, it's more complex than we need to worry about at the moment. Uh, but this is just kind of the way you would specify that model, uh, which is to say, give me an, uh, show me what it looks like when average depends on this interaction, but not on either of these main effects. And you can just use those minus terms um, to get those out of there. Uh, similarly, I think you can kind of do the opposite. If you, I don't know why you would do this, it would be just kind of wasted typing, 
But uh, you could, I think you could do this this way. Yeah, uh, nope, you can't. <laughs> so uh, you can't get the main effects just by doing that. Um, you'd have to do it just this other way, like I showed you before. So sorry for wasting five seconds of your time there. But there's a lot of fun things you can do um, in terms of model building just by using these R equations. Uh, and I'm just mentioning this, I think, mostly to give you a sense that um, we're kind of taking an active role in this and deciding what sort of model we want to test or how we want to kind of construe the data at the end of the day. Uh, you have choices in terms of how this model is constructed, right? You're not just kind of doing this mindlessly. Uh, once you recognize that maybe an ANOVA or a linear regression would be an appropriate way to analyze your data, you can say, well, I want to determine whether like this factor has an effect on my dependent measure or maybe this factor or maybe the interaction between the two, but you're not just sort of automatically committed to the whole thing. You have choices. Um, as a practical matter, as scientists, normally we have no idea what's going on ahead of time, so you should throw everything in there just to see what matters. Uh, but after the fact, you can kind of build the model up from scratch, uh, including only what you found as significant um, through your analysis. Hopefully this isn't going into too much detail for the moment, so I'm just going to move on uh, because what we have found, at least to start off with, is that we have this significant interaction, and that's all we know for the moment is that when, you know, batter handedness interacts with pitcher handedness in some way, it can have an effect on average overall. So one way to try to figure out what's going on there is to graph that interaction. Um, and there's a couple of different ways you could graph that interaction. Um, and I'm doing this uh, in a new way in R. Actually, I played around with this over the weekend to get this to work. And I've got the code for doing this down here. I'm not going to walk you through all this mess because it took a while to figure out. But you can draw simply lines in your graph connecting sort of one mean of one subgroup to another. Um, and a simple way to do it is to just say, OK, I'll plot um, my two different batter handednesses on the x-axis uh, and then I'll connect them up to the different um, pictures uh, up here with lines uh, and the reason I'm doing this is because we can kind of see this crossover effect of the interaction so the red line here is showing you what happens when the pitcher is right-handed down here we have what happens to average when the batter is right-handed so it's pretty low and then when it switched switches to a left-handed batter and a right-handed pitcher the average goes up uh, and we get the opposite effect here when we have a right-handed batter and a left-handed pitcher. The purple line is left-handed pitchers. When they're mismatched, it's high. When they're matched in handedness, it goes down. Um, so that's a simple way to see it, I guess you could say. Um, it took me a while to kind of tweak this so that I could get this other effect I wanted to show you of these lines kind of splitting apart from each other. And this is not a way you would normally plot data, I don't think. Uh, but this is, uh, again, showing you batter handedness on the um, x-axis. And then it's showing you uh, in the gray line uh, what happens when the pitcher has a different, uh, using a different hand than the batter. And the black line is when the pitcher is using the same hand as the batter. And this kind of easily shows you that um, when it's the same hand, there's a lower average overall, and when it's a different hand, it's a higher average overall, at least superficially, right? It's just the weird part of this is you would not normally just plot <laughs> like same as same or different as sort of the um, graphical variable for uh, the other dimension of this. Normally, you'd want to know exactly what hand the pitcher is using rather than trying to have to like interpret it on top of the data that's thrown out in front of you. But what we see here, um, it's kind of the thing that's the tip off that this is an interaction happening is this crossover effect. Uh, and it looks very different from what we'd see if there was just a simple main effect which is where you uh, normally expect to see parallel lines of some sort. Uh, so I have that plotted over here with green and blue lines. Um, so this is made up data. This is not actually the way the world works in this case. But let's say we had um, main effects, actually two potentially significant main effects, uh, one for the batters and one for the pitchers. And in this case, what this is showing you is that the batter effect is that the left-handed batters do better than the right-handed batters because they have a higher average overall. So just regardless of who's pitching, um, their average goes up if they're left-handed batters. Like I said, normally in baseball, the left-handed batters have 
some funny little advantages, like they're closer to first base, that sort of thing. Um, this is a made-up world where they just have an overall average over right-handed batters. So, you know, find nine lefties and stock your team up with them. Go win the World Series or something like that. Uh, but the opposite is true here for the pitchers. So we have, again, a main effect in this made-up world. Um, so overall, the blue line, which is the right-handed pitchers, have a lower average than the green line, which is the left-handed pitchers. So the right-handed pitchers are consistently doing better um, than the left-handed pitchers. So that's the pitcher effect. There's a pitcher effect. There's a batter effect, but there's no interaction. What we'd see with an interaction is these lines not being parallel, um, and they probably do something like this crossover, although they don't need to cross over per se. They just need to kind of go in opposite directions. Um, but the main idea behind an interaction is that when the level of one factor has changed, it has different effects on the distinct levels of the other factor, right? So in this case, we can say start out here, um, where we have left-handed pitchers and right-handed pitchers for the right-handed batters. And then we're just going to switch the batter um, handedness. So in this case, the right-handed pitchers are doing better than the left-handed pitchers. But if I switch the handedness of the batter, I get the opposite case, where the left-handed pitchers are doing better than the right-handed pitchers. Uh, so they're moving in opposite directions. That's sort of the core of an interaction um, in your data. Uh, the other way to interpret it is, again, quantitatively. Um, so uh, for this, we have to run post-talk tests. I've mentioned these multiple times before, but we're going to walk through them again, uh, adding a few bells and whistles as we go. Um, but to start off with, we can keep in mind that for our two-way ANOVA example, we had a null hypothesis for the interaction. Sorry, just checking my clock. Uh, that the averages for all the combinations of pitcher and batters right, uh, sorry, pitcher and batter handedness, uh, we're all the same. So there's four possible groupings here. Uh, before, we looked at a null hypothesis for a one-way ANOVA where we had like three different places of articulation, and we said the means of P, T, and K were all the same. We found out they were different. We had to run some post-talk tests to figure out how they were different. In this case, uh, we're looking at this interaction. Uh, we have four different groups, which are by default assumed to be the same as each other. We find out through our analysis that they're not. So now we have to figure out how are these different from each other. And that means we have a lot of testing to do, or at least more than we had last time, because four groups is more than three. And they can combine in more ways than just three different groups can. So the simplest approach to running this post hoc series of post hoc tests is that we have to check every single one of these combos against the others, and then guard ourselves against false alarms with the Bonferroni correction. Uh, that's actually not the simplest way to do it. It's sort of like the sim most simple-minded way to run this analysis uh, because it's kind of going to wind up being slightly harder on ourselves than we really need it to be. But I'll do it anyway because I've already talked about this sort of approach um, both in this lecture and the previous two. Uh, so thankfully for me, I've already typed out the codes for this. So I'll just copy and paste them into my R console. But I need to break up my data into uh, subsets for each batter and pitcher combo. So like my left-handed batters, right-handed pitchers, so on and so forth, all four different possibilities. And then what I'm going to do is just run t-tests, comparing the mean averages for these four different groups against each other. And since we're going to run a bunch of tests, we're actually going to run six, I'm going to keep score as we go. So I'll do that in this... Um, spreadsheet over here. Maybe I'll make it a little bit bigger so you can see this. But we'll do uh, lefty, 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 righty, lefty, or sorry, righty, lefty, and righty, righty. Um, and I'll make a um, four by four matrix to keep track of these results. Uh, and then I'm also going to, at the far end here, I'm going to plop down the average. So for lefty, so like to start off with, we're comparing lefty, lefty against lefty, righty. So both lefties here, right-handed pitcher, left-handed batter over here. Uh, we have a very small p-value here, 2.254 times 10 to the negative fifth. So that's small. <laughs> we don't really care how small it is because it's that small. Um, but what we see here, we're comparing averages, right? So um, our average for the lefty-lefties is about 0.415 if you round up. 
And then for the lefty-righty combo, it's 0.480. Uh, so these two are different from each other, and we know from the means that the lefty-righty combo is going to be bigger than the lefty-lefty. Um, moving right along, we go compare lefty-lefty to righty-lefty. Uh, we don't need to know anything new about the means for the lefty-lefties. That'll stay the same all the way through. But for the righty-lefty combo, we get a mean average or mean of 0.471. That also yields a very small p-value, so that's significant as, as well. And then lastly, we have lefty-lefty versus righty-righty. The p-value there is only 0.08, which you see right here, so that's not significant. But we do find out what the uh, surface mean is for that sample for righty-righty. It's 0.437. All right, halfway to home, <laughs> rounding second, uh, but actually rounding third because there are six different tests we have to run here. Uh, the other combo we want to look at here is lefty-righty versus righty-lefty. We get a p-value of 0.38 in this case, so that's not significantly different, um, and that's just 0.48 versus 0.47, so those are pretty close on the surface anyways. Uh, we just have to run two more tests, and we're basically done with this part of it. These other two turn out to be significant as well. So lefty-righty versus righty-righty, we get 0 0.0002. That's significant as well. Uh, we can see that the lefty-righty combo is much higher than the righty-righty combo. And the last one also gives us a significant p-value. We'll plot it out to 0 0.0005. So on and so forth. It's just just saying that righty-lefty combos have a higher average than righty-righty combos. Um, so I'll make that bold as well. So we're getting four significant results here. These are our averages, and then we get two non-significant results. But the last part of this that we haven't thought about yet is that we have to apply the correction bone Ferroni correction to this, uh, at least according to, to the rules of the game so far. And that means our new alpha criterion is uh, going to be 0 0.05 divided by 6. Since we're running six different post hoc tests, we divide that criterion by 6. And that makes the new criterion 0 0.00333, so on and so forth, all the way to infinity. Um, and it turns out, if we look more closely at our p-values here, uh, that doesn't change any of these. So these are the ones that are significant that might be affected by this. And kind of thankfully for us, these are all small enough that it's not going to matter. So they stay put where they are. Um, but in theory, they could change um, based on this new criterion. Um, and that's why you apply it. Um, lastly, on top of that, those mechanical steps of running the t-tests and then also applying the correction to them, um, you have to figure out what they are telling you. And I guess I'll mention as well here, I'm running the t-tests in the most simple-minded way possible with this Welch correction. You could look at these and say, well, I could run paired t-tests here, uh, or I could think about running variance equal tests if I check whether the variances are equal first, that sort of thing, and I might get more power in my analysis that way. It's not going to make that much of a difference in this case, uh, and you already know how to do that, so I'm not going to dwell on that, but you can keep those things in mind for your own data. Um, as you move on into the end of the semester and the beginning of your life after this class. Uh, but um, basically what these tests are telling us are, is what we kind of have to figure out um, to understand the story here. But it's basically saying these two values um, are bigger than these two values. Uh, so consistently, every time we compare one of these two values to the ones on the edges here, um, the mixed hand combos have a or different hand combos have a higher average overall than the same hand combos, which are these two values here. And then when I compare the different hand combos to each other, there's no significant difference. When I compare the same hand combos to each other, uh, there's no signif significant difference there either. And this is the way that I normally sort of transcribe that when I'm going through the results of my own data here. I put a comma in between groupings that are not significantly different from each other, and I put a um, greater than sign between groups that are. Uh, so the LR combo um, has the highest sort of surface average. That goes first, and then the RL, and then greater than LL and RR, so on and so forth. I think I should actually, to keep consistent, uh, change that so it's RR, LL. So from left to right, they go from biggest to smallest in order. Um, yep, uh, and the greater than sign shows you what's significantly different from each other. It doesn't always work out this neatly, 
to a certain extent, you might sometimes want to keep a table like this. But for now, we'll just leave it like this because it's a pretty straightforward story, which is this story right here. Um, and again, when it's a comma, it means these differences between these two groupings is not significantly different. Uh, okay, that being said, uh, we've been walking through this in a uh, very simple-minded fashion using the Bone-Ferroni correction, which is the one that is most widely known and uh, for whatever reason is, I guess, m often most applied to data like this because it's the most conservative adjustment you can make to your post hoc testing results, uh, which again is there to help you avoid making type 1 errors. However, um, it may be more conservative than we really need it to be. Um, there are other options that um, kind of both, well, they both enable you to get uh, more significant results out of your data, I guess I could say, and also potentially do less work to get there. Uh, so one of these um, approaches is the planned comparisons route in which you only do post hoc testing on the factors that you initially cared about. Um, so, for in example, in this case, let's say um, I had a theoretical question. I knew something about baseball. I already kind of knew about this, like, different hands versus same hands effect, and I didn't really care about comparing groups across that boundary against each other. And I just wanted to know, well, you, you know, will I do better if I'm, like, a righty facing a lefty versus being a lefty facing a righty? I could just, like, only run a t-test on that comparison there. And I just have to run one post hoc test, and therefore my alpha criterion wouldn't be diminished at all. Um, something simple like that, or maybe even more realistically, uh, going back to this sort of case, uh, and this is actually something that's going to come up in the homework. Um, let's say I'm a batter who can um, bat both right-handed and left-handed against a pitcher. Uh, and so maybe I just want to know, like, if I'm facing a right-handed pitcher, this red line, like, is this dot significantly different from this dot? Because I could bat either way against this dude, uh, and will it be worth it to me to sort of switch hands to go try to get this boost here at the, um, on the far right? Okay, that's something you might do as a planned comparison, and you wouldn't do this comparison between uh, for the left-handed pitchers because that's something you can't control. Um, that's just not part of the situation, and you want to run less post talk tests because you're in the middle of a baseball game and you only have so much time, right? Even though baseball is a game with a lot of downtime. Um, anyways, this is all being a little bit silly. A more realistic example for your life might say, um, you know, we know that, um, say, we've got some F0 data from a group of speakers. Uh, for instance, I had a student just to defend his dissertation on uh, Swahili VOT and F0, uh, where he looked at sort of um, how F0 changed between different types of stops, aspirated and unaspirated stops. He also had different groups of speakers producing uh, these stops and F0 values. They were men and women, so on and so forth. We know that, um, male and female F0 values differ from each other considerably. Uh, it's trivial to sort of analyze that again. Uh, but what might be more interesting to figure out is whether aspiration in Swahili has an effect on F0 in Swahili. So you could say just cut out the testing of speaker gender altogether uh, and just focus on post hoc tests looking at how different stop types might um, affect F0. And you could go down from you know running six post hoc tests to three that sort of thing, and therefore you just lower your criterion by not as much, um, and therefore potentially get more significant effects that you could talk about uh, in the results of your analysis. That's the idea behind running plan comparisons. And again, the plan part of this is sort of the crucial part of it. So before you do any sort of ANOVA running or post hoc testing, you say, well, I'm going to look at these factors in my ANOVA. Maybe I'll include gender in there just because I know that accounts for some variance, and I need to just kind of deal with the aspiration part of it in addition to that or aside from that. Um, but I'm not going to analyze gender in the post hoc testing if I get a significant effect for it because I don't really care. I already know that male and females have, males and females have different F0s from each other. Uh, what I don't know is like about the stops, that sort of thing. So you plan ahead of time, you commit to it before you run any of the stats, and then once you get to the point where it's relevant to run 
postdoc tests on, say, an aspiration factor. That's the only one you do. And you simplify your workload overall. You stay honest because you're committing to your initial plan. And then you may get more significant effects to talk about at the end of the day than would be given to you by like just applying a bone for correction across the board for everything in the world that you might have to test. Okay, hopefully that's clear. I used a lot of words to get there. Uh, so I'll try to just keep moving and talk about another approach to post hoc testing or sort of correcting the alpha va value for your post hoc tests, which is the home correction, which honestly I wish people knew about more than the Bonferroni correction because it's still valid but less conservative. Uh, and it makes a lot of sense. And I wish people would just apply it by default uh, rather than something like the Bonferroni correction. How does this work, you say? It sounds like it's too good to be true. Well, let me tell you, I've got a deal for you, that in this approach, you start by ordering the results of your post hoc tests from the smallest p-value to the largest, um, which, yeah, seems a little bit like post hoc, the post hoc, uh, but this is how it works. So for the smallest p-value, after you've lined them all up, and again, you just commit to using this method ahead of time and it's still valid, um, because you're going to get an order of p-values no matter what you do. Uh, for the smallest p-value, your alpha value is 0.05 divided by n, which is the Bonferroni correction again, uh, because n is the number of post hoc tests you need to run overall. But then you evaluate whether that p-value is still significant or not. And for the next smallest p-value, let's say you start out with six tests total, you're dividing by six for the first one. For the next smallest one, you're dividing by five. Uh, because you only have five tests remaining. So there, the sort of adjusted Bonferroni correction still applies. You divide the remaining p-values, uh, the alpha by five. Uh, so it's 0.05 divided by n minus one. You keep going in that way until you get to the last test, which is the biggest p-value, and you divide that by one. Um, yeah, so this is still um, a pretty stringent criterion, right? Uh, because the smaller p-values still have to beat um, a very sort of tight criterion, which has been reduced by the number of post hoc tests you need to run. Uh, so, but if they do, that's fine. If they don't, that's fine as well. It's just what you get. Uh, but then that criterion is kind of getting relaxed a bit as you go up the p-scale in your results until you get to the last one where it's just like without any correction at all. Uh, and in case that didn't make any sense, I'll show you how that works with our baseball handedness data. So I'm listing out the results here uh, in order of their p-value. So the smallest p-value from one of these tests is the LR versus LL combination, which also, uh, at least superficially, has the biggest difference in means here is 0.48 versus 0.41. And for that, I'm applying basically the Bonferroni correction. I'm dividing that alpha criterion by six. It gives me this. Um, and that is still bigger than this p-value. I feel like this is not what I mentioned it should be before, but I'll double check if that's the case afterwards. Uh, the second smallest p-value, this one's about three times as big as this one, or maybe three and a half. Uh, either way, it's smaller than 0.05 divided by five. And so you're gonna see, we've seen all these results before. What's gonna change here is what I'm dividing by as I move up the scale of p-values. Uh, so this one, you divide 0.05 by 4, you get 0.0125 as your criterion. You still beat it. Uh, the next one, still beat that, but it's 0.05 divided by 3, uh, which is 0.016667, so on and so forth. Then just all the way up the scale. Um, these two are still bigger than 0.05. So this is never going to get bigger than 0.05 over here. So for that reason, they're still not significant. But all this is sort of an, a valid way to apply this criterion to the data. Uh, in a way to sort of both find out what's meaningfully different in the data and also not get too many type one errors or false alarms. Uh, that's the home correction. So in this particular case, that doesn't actually change any of the results, but hopefully this table will make it easier to see how to apply the correction um, in this case. Again, though, you just have to commit to using this before you run any of the post hoc tests. You can't sort of after the fact say, well, you know, I did, I applied the Bonferroni correction to these results, and you know this one 
might have been significantly different had I not done that. So maybe I'll go back and just apply the home correction after the fact to get that significant result because that's the one I really wanted after all. Uh, just make this decision decision before you run the analysis and you're okay. You're just being honest with yourself and with your data that way. And because I am a dork, I need to correct this uh, <laughs> to 0 .008. 3333. Three, three, three. Sorry about that, but I didn't want to post it the wrong way. And maybe you caught that ahead of time. If you did, go buy yourself a donut because I would give you a donut in class had you pointed that out. Uh, but we're living in virtual world, so maybe just give yourself a virtual donut, whatever. Um, anyways, more practical advice. If you have factors with more than three levels in your analysis, you can quickly get an un unmanageable number of post hoc tests to run. Uh, and in fact, with this in mind, uh, even if you're running an ANOVA with three factors in it, regardless of how many levels they have, uh, things can get complicated quite quickly. It's not super easy, even with a two-way ANOVA, to figure out what the interactions are telling you. But when you have like a three-way interaction uh, or a three-way interaction, it gets even harder. I can't remember if I mentioned this in previous lectures or not, but the first experiment I ran as a grad student um, I'll say I, I didn't necessarily get the best advice about how to run it, but there were, it was about um, audiovisual speech perception of stop place of articulation. Uh, and I wanted to look at like all these different factors like does place matter? Does the vowel matter? Does um, the modality matter like audio versus audiovisual? So on and so forth. Anyways, I came up with like eight factors that I wanted to like test in this experiment and I threw them all into my ANOVA. Uh, so I had some like four or five way interactions in that thing ultimately. And like once you get to a four way interaction, it just, you know, your mind just gets overloaded and you can't figure out exactly what it says unless you're very, very smart, in which case you probably won't be able to communicate it that easily to anybody else. So I just say stop at three. It's not really worth it to run even like a four way ANOVA. Uh, three is about as complicated as you want to get uh, in a way that will be like communicable and also meaningfully testable in your analysis. Uh, but if you have a factor with more than three levels in your analysis, you also have a problem because there's just so many comparisons you have to make after the fact when you're running the post hoc tests. Uh, and one way to work around this problem, um, this again is practical advice, is to use what is called Tukey's Honestly Significant Difference Test, which is normally abbreviated HSD. But this is honestly the test's name. It's the Honestly Significant Difference Test. Um, and it was created by this guy named Mr. Tukey. Uh, actually, he has a real first name. I can't remember what it was. But I should because this guy was uh, pretty brilliant. Um, or at least he invented a lot of cool things we still use to this day, uh, including the box plot, which we've talked about in this class. He also invented the fast Fourier transform, which is how uh, a program like PROT will generate spectrograms on the fly which is pretty cool. And he also invented the computer term bit uh, for like a bit of information, like a zero or one. So um, this is the point at which I make the dad joke and say that Mr. Tukey was no turkey. But <laughs> the point that's important for us right now is how does this HSD test work? Uh, and it works as a form of post hoc testing um, for things like the results of an ANOVA. Uh, he came up with this test statistic, which he called Q way before QAnon became famous. Uh, and this is how you calculate this test statistic. I'm not going to dwell on the details here that much, but this is the difference in means. These N sub X and N sub Y are the number of items in each sample. That MS error is the error term from the ANOVA. We've talked about how to calculate that. Um, I'm not gonna dwell on the details here. I'm just gonna say it generates a Q statistic, which it turns out, uh, it falls on a Q distribution that depends on the range of one of the sample distributions, which is kind of funny. So this is sometimes called the range test rather than the HSD test. Uh, but the main point of it is that the Q value can be tested in a similar fashion to the Z and T distributions we've all grown to know and love. So you get a Q statistic out of this, and then you convert that to like a P value based on where it falls on the distribution. I'm not going to walk through all that again, because even when you run these things, it doesn't tell you any of this information. It just gives you the P values at the end of the day. Um, the cool part is that the Tukey test is less conservative than the Bonferroni correction, but still more conservative than other post hoc tests. 
Um, so you therefore should and can use it whenever possible. And the command for doing so in R is actually quite simple. So to show you um, how to do this for an ANOVA, this is the two-way ANOVA we ran for the baseball data not too long ago, actually at the beginning of this lecture. Uh, and this tells me I have this significant result for the interaction. And if I want to run this for the same, the two-key test for the same set of data, then all I do is I switch the word summary here, that command, to two-key HSD. And then I hit return, and I get a lot of numbers. And so um, this is all we have here. Uh, so again, it doesn't tell you specifics so much. Um, if you look at one result here, uh, this is for the batters. It's telling you what is that difference in means where I subtract, um, I have R minus L, so the right-handed mean minus the left-handed mean. That value is this, it's 0 0.006. And then it gives me the confidence intervals for that mean, uh, or the, the confidence interval, the 95% confidence interval for that particular mean. Uh, if it encompasses zero, that confidence interval, then it's gonna be a non-significant result as it is here. Um, and you might notice that the, uh, the p-values here for these main effects are the exact same as they are for the ANOVA, which is kind of reassuring. Um, neither of these are significant for that reason. We kind of can ignore them anyway because we knew that going in. What we care about are these batter-pitcher differences. Um, and these are going to tell me something similar to the postdoc test I ran a moment ago. Um, but what you look, here, look for here is basically... Um, what the p-value is, and it says, as it says here, these are adjusted p-values, so it applies a sort of correction to these p-values, they're not the raw values um, that we've seen before. So that means that I can just take a look at these and say if they're less than 0.05, I'm getting a significant effect here. And that's the case for the four that we saw before, where we're comparing same hands versus different hands combos. Those are all going to be significant values, uh, p-values for these post hoc tests. And the ones where we get um, sort of same hands versus same hands or different hands versus different hands, we get non-significant p-values like this. Uh, so that is easy in the sense that you can run the test very quickly. Uh, it takes a while to sift through this data and figure out what it's telling you. Um, so yeah, you can kind of watch out for that as you might apply this to your own research. Uh, but that's how that works, the two-key honestly significant difference test. Um, yeah, uh, the other kind of simple approach you can use is this pairwise.ttest function that R provides to you. Um, so for this, I'm going to do something which I would recommend you not ever do, but this is just for expository purposes. But I'm loading up our VOT data from the very beginning of the term uh, where we had everybody just repeat uh, these words three times and then measure their VOT. Uh, and so the thing I'm going to do, which I wouldn't recommend doing in an ANOVA, is that we're going to use speaker as our independent factor here uh, and then see how VOT depends on speaker. Um, so the reason why I wouldn't recommend doing that, uh, especially with a um, data set that's this big, is that we have 13 different speakers. And then, not surprisingly, we get a significant effect of speaker, which means we have to make comparisons between all the 13 different levels of speaker here to figure out what's going on in it. Um, so the only reason I'm running this is to show you just how easy this pairwise t-test command is to run. Um, so here's the syntax for it. And again, I'll raise this up a bit so that maybe you can see it better on your screen. Um, but it's just saying, um, look at my dependent measure here on the left side of this command, and then my independent measure over here, and then it will do all the different pairwise comparisons for me. Um, it spits them out in a table uh, that looks like this, and this is, uh, well, this is what it's doing here. It's running t-tests with pooled standard deviation, and it just spits out the p-values at the end of the day, uh, which again is sort of like, you know, stats professors or real statisticians will just often kind of harp on like you don't just look at the p-value you need to look at sort of what the rest of the test is telling you um so try not to dwell too much on these this information but uh this is kind of the practical part of the testing is that you get this information to decide on the basis of this 
whether something is significant or not. And a lot of these are very, very small. Um, a lot of these are very, very big. Uh, and there's just a few in the middle. I'll, I'm kind of going to focus on this comparison here between Charles and Theodora for the moment because it's very close to that 0.05 criterion. It's 0.07205. And I'll mention down here the default adjustment method for this test is the home correction, which makes me happy because I feel like it's the best option to use. Uh, but you can change that around if you want. You can use the bone Ferroni correction by specifying the adjustment over here at the end of the command B, and it's P adjust equals bonf, uh, and I kind of like that word bonf. It's maybe the fancy way to say the word banff, I don't know. Um, but if you use that command, then you get a different set of results. So before this comparison between Charles and Theodora was 0 0.07205. For the Bonferroni correction, it's 0 0.23416. So this is the part that's a little tricky to remember with this approach. But before I said when you apply these corrections, what you want to do is you divide your criterion by the number of tests you're running. Uh, that's not what the pairwise t-test is doing. Instead, the pairwise t-test command is multiplying your p-value by the relevant number of tests that would be applied to for that correction in that particular case. Um, so these p-values can get bigger if you're multiplying by a bigger n, basically. Um, and to hopefully show you what I mean, um, I will try this one other way, which is to run the pairwise t-test with no correction at all. Um, so we're just keeping the alpha at 0.05 here. But what happens is this, this gives you the unfiltered p-values for these tests. So this Charles and Theodora pairing starts off at 0 0.003, which normally you'd say that's probably definitely significant, right? That's a very small p-value. But when you apply these corrections to it, like the Bonferroni correction, you have to multiply it by a very large number. I don't know exactly what that is, like 80 something maybe, something like that. Uh, and you get a p-value of 0.234 because you're just making so many different comparisons between speakers here. Uh, and that's why this gets big. And I guess if the p-value when you multiply it gets too big, it just lists it as one. Um, so uh, yeah, that's how you get or can interpret the results of this sort of command. Again, it's easy because you can do all these comparisons very quickly. Um, but, um, and I'll mention as well, you can also run a paired t-test option for these guys with this paired equals t here. And that might give you a little bit more power for this. Um, and in this particular case, it shows you with, yeah, that's what the home correction. Maybe I'll run that with um, no adjustment like that. Um, so in that case, our Charles and Theodora comparison is even smaller. It's 0 0.0006. Yeah. So that gives you a little more power, a few more significant P or T test results there. Uh, but you've got a lot to worry about in this particular case anyway. So I'll do this one more time um, by focusing on a variable that requires us to run a much smaller number of tests. And then maybe you can see how this is working. So in this case, I'll look at um, how VOT depends on the stop that's being produced here. We'll start off with no adjustment. Um, and this is just making three comparisons, right? So P versus K, T versus K, and then T versus P. With no adjustments, these are all significant. The biggest one is this T versus K comparison, which is 0 0.029 for a p-value. And the others are smaller than that. Um, if I do this with the home correction, then uh, what I'm going to see is that the smallest one, which is this guy, that p-value gets multiplied by 3. The second smallest one, the p-value gets multiplied by 2. And then for the biggest one, it stays the same. And then I just apply the alpha criterion of 0.05 across the board. They're still all significant, which is nice to see. Um, but then, uh, and we're still doing it in a valid way. We can also apply the bon Bonferroni correction to this, uh, in which case we multiply every p-value by 3 um, across the board. Uh, and this one, which started out as 0.029, becomes 0.0869. All of a sudden, this is over the top. 
Uh, so it's bigger than the criterion, and we consider this no longer to be significant. Uh, but that just goes to show you, you can run the home correction, and it's still valid, and you'll get more significant results to talk about. It's not significant here just because of the application of the correction, even though it's okay to think of it as significant here because that beats 0.05, that criterion. Um, hopefully this makes sense. I am going to stop talking about this all for now, right now, uh, because, again, I have to go elsewhere. Um, and also because I think it's time to move on. This is how you interpret the results of significant effects in an ANOVA. And it just gets a little more complicated when you're dealing with an interaction, but this is how you would basically do it. And hopefully I've given you enough like practical pointers to make it relatively easy for you when you find these things out in the wild. Uh, okay, we have one more topic to talk about with um, ANOVAs, which is repeated measures ANOVA. I'll address that hopefully within the next day or two, um, but that's also going to be quite helpful for most of the data you're probably going to uh, collect. But for now, uh, I'm signing off, and lucky you, there will be no more baseball for the time being uh, in talking about ANOVAs, so we can be thankful that we've gotten to this point already. All right, see you again next time. <laughs>